Let's talk about the marketplace. Darren Newsom is here. He's from DTN. He's going to take you through the next 45 or 50 minutes or so. Darren, everybody probably has seen or read you at some point in time. I have one little thing for you. DTN, um, in 1985, when you were just becoming a real network of sorts, and everybody had, remember the DTN machines you had on your desk? I was working for Dan Zwicker at okay. that time. Uh, it was actually 1980, summer of 1986. And the first pay-for-view premium advice was delivered by Dan Zwicker and Mr. Brock. Hmm. But I wrote it for <laughs> Dan. Now, I listened to Dan, but I, he hired me coming out of college to write that. And so I maintained that the very first premium piece of delivered advice that came through DTN came from me, because I don't think Brock beat me that day. I think, I think well, it was Dan Zwicker and myself. There you here, go. <laughs> here he is, Darren Newsom. You see him on DTN all the time. Darren, they're all yours to talk about the marketplace. All right. Thank you, Todd. Really appreciate it. And I also want to thank everybody with the Illinois Sobean Association for, you know, inviting me here today from Todd, Dan, um, everybody else. Uh, you know, there's nothing more... F okay. Now I'll see if we can get some feedback here going between the two mics. Uh, I will be jumping back and forth. Let me see if I can get... Okay, that'll work fine. All right, this works better for me anyway because I like to move around. Those of you who have seen me before know I don't do well standing behind a podium. Uh, I will go back over to look at the numbers because there's, there's a lot of numbers to look at this morning. And we even had more released uh, at the USDA Outlook Forum. But before we get going, talking about predominantly soybeans, but at the end I'm going to open it up where you can ask me what... It, Ever market you'd like to know about. I want to mention one piece of my history is that years, decades ago, I worked in a little country elevator in, in the middle of Kansas. And seeing Chad's demonstration of using a drone to go to the top of the elevator to check things out would have been a godsend. My manager loved to say, climb up there, check all the bins. That's a long climb in the middle of summer. So that would have been great if it had been available, but it's not. It wasn't. I should say it is now. All right. What's more fun than the markets? We've all had a great time watching them over the last year, year and a half. But as the title of my piece suggests, my talk this morning suggests, there's conflicting signals, particularly in the soybeans, that I think is going to take another two to three months, quarter of a year, half a year, to work themselves out. And it all starts with a lot of numbers up here. Uh, this is basically the complete set of numbers going back to the, the original baseline numbers from USDA early February 2015, you know, through last year's outlook, all the way through this past month's USDA supply and demand report. A lot of numbers. And you'll see that things tend to change. But with any USDA report, really there's only two numbers that make any difference. And they're not, when it comes to soybeans, they're not right anyway, but it's the numbers that we have. If you look at the far right column and you go all the way down to the next to last figure, see that it's 450 million bushels. That's ending stocks at the end of 2015, 2016 marketing year. That's projected at the end of August uh, here in 2016. Notice it's at a 10 million bushel increase from what we saw in January. That 10 million bushels came from a like decrease in crush demand, which was interesting because we left export demand 
unchanged at if I can 1.69 billion bushels. The problem is because of huge South American harvest going on right now and the strength of the US dollar index, we're behind pace to hit that 1.69. So what might that do? Eventually, as these reports continue to pile up, up until say May when all the attention goes to the quote unquote initial new crop look, and I, and I get a big kick out of that, uh, May gets all of this hype because it's the initial USDA report, not counting the same numbers that we're seeing today, the numbers that are put together at the end of March when we get the prospective plannings numbers. So initial doesn't necessarily mean the same thing to everybody. Um, initial actually is the third time we'll see the numbers. So what we've got now is 450 million bushels of projected ending stocks that could change here in March and April. Notice over the course of time, the largest that number's been was 500 million. The other number that's important is the very bottom number, ending stocks to use. You take ending stocks, you divide it by total demand. The higher that number, the more bearish. That number keeps going up, up to about 12.2%. Um, so what's all that mean? Here's a look at how that looks graphically. The 450 million is the yellow column off to the far right hand side. That is the largest, in, if it comes to pass, that is the largest ending stocks to use figure going back to what, 2005, 2006? Ending stocks to use, 12.2, also the largest. We've got a lot of soybeans. We've got a lot of competition on the global stage. Makes it tough as we watch the market every day to expect it to ever break out of this sideways, I call it a dead zone that it's trading in. It just can't do it. It just keeps moving sideways. You know, I was visiting with Todd earlier this morning, he, he said it right. Every once in a while we'll see soybeans try to rally and the rest of the markets, the rest of the you know, commodity complex, outside markets just stomp on its head, stomp on its hands, push it right back down. It just can't move anywhere. All right, so the next slide looks at, um, this is again the US ending stocks and the national average price that USDA is projecting. Right now, at least in its February report, they're looking at 880. So just look how that price continues to come down year after year, you know, as the ending stocks, uh, domestic ending stocks continue to go up. So again, painting or adding to the picture that the overall supply and demand situation in the United States is relatively bearish. But is it just a United States problem? You know, as we look at all the different grain markets, we, we have to take different things into account. In corn, you know, for decades, the U.S. was the biggest player. What happened here basically set the tone for the entire market. Wheat, it's such a global market anymore. What happens here doesn't really cause a flutter in the market at all. But soybeans, it's a 50-50 deal. It's the United States and South America. And what we're looking at when we start talking about global supply and demand is numbers that are almost as frightening as what we saw in the, in the world, excuse me, on the, on, the, on the domestic side. Here we've got, uh, again, ending stocks, 80.4, million metric tons, huge number. 
Last marketing year, just a little over 77 million metric tons. Last in the January report, 79.3. So we actually went up again because we saw total supplies increase. Production up a little bit, I believe, yep. Yeah. Brazil crop, 100 million metric tons. The question is Argentina's, 58.5 million metric tons. Both of those could be called into question as we go forward. It seems like we're more comfortable with the 100 million metric tons in Brazil, but the 58 and a half in Argentina, that could come down a bit. And that could start to change the supply and demand situation. But as you noticed on that uh, bottom chart, uh, on that last chart, notice what the ending stocks to use did. Ending stocks to use from last year, when ending stocks were just 77 million metric tons, we had ending stocks to use at 25.7. All right, now we increase ending stocks to 80.4 million metric tons, but what happens? Ending stocks to use comes down. How is that possible? Because global demand continues to go up. The green column, that's total supplies, that's global supplies. And we see with the production going on across the world, no real problems this year. Uh, again, Argentina's had some weather problems. Brazil had some weather problems. And it's, as harvest goes on, we'll see how much uh, change that might actually do in production. But the key to me is the red column. It's something that corn doesn't have, and that is global demand continues to go up. And when I say global demand comes out, goes up, where does that come from? Who's the big buyer? Exactly. Demand from China continues to go up. All of this talk that China's economic situation is going to blow up the soybean market, you know, gonna, the world soybean market, just isn't going to happen. Not all commodity demands are created equal. Commodities based on food that demand's not going to go down. Crude oil, diesel, distillates, whatever you want to call it, um, copper, industrial metals, yeah, those have decreased. And yes, they're causing problems for the commodity sector as a whole, but China's demand's not going away. And in fact, we're out seeing them doing a lot of buying in the agricultural industries. So China's not going away. The, pro, you know, the issue is, who are they going to buy from? Is it going to be the United States, Brazil, Argentina? Right now, and again, we'll have a chart on it later, the strength of the U.S. dollar and the weakness of the, of the Brazilian real certainly doesn't paint a very good picture. That 1.69 billion bushels of U.S. exports could be difficult, could be difficult to achieve by the time we hit... Uh, by the time we hit the end of the marketing year. Here's just another look at uh, the growth in global demand and the little dip down over on the right-hand side of ending stocks to use. So, you know, ending stocks to use are still high. 25.6% is still high. As we look at, you know, look at that number you know, against what we've seen in the past, it's still a high number but it did go down. And that's the important thing. That's something that we don't see, again, in the corn market. So, overall, I think we could say with the 450 million bushels of ending stocks projected for the United States, the, what was it, 80.4, something along that line, projected for the world, the situation in soybeans is bearish. Every USD, every USD report we see says the same thing. It just keeps getting more and more bearish. And the market reflects it by not being able to move out of this sideways trend that it's been in for quite some time. So, 
I look at things a little different way. To me, I base everything on charts, trends, because it tells me the flow of what's going on in the market. As I say so often, with USDA reports in general, I get more entertainment than information from them. To me, you know, they're good to talk about, they drive trade, but they don't paint the real picture. At least they only paint half of the picture. First part of a market structure, and every market is the same way. You can look at any market, particularly in commodities, but financials as well. Every market has a structure, it's based on trends, and trend is nothing more than price direction over time. So all we have to do is watch how, what direction a market is moving in regards to price over a set period of time. It can be short term, intermediate term, long term, whatever you choose. The trend of the futures market is basically a reflection of the flow of investment money. And this is a key point, particularly going back to 2005, 2006, when the dynamics of commodities changed forever. They're not going back to the old days where we might see a 10 cent range for the year in corn. It's an investment opportunity now. And futures prices, the way they move over time, reflect the flow of this investment money or interest from the investment community as a whole. But there is a fundamental component, and that is the future spreads. And this is what I look at for fundamentals. And this is what is so often, particularly in soybeans, in contrast with what we see from USDA. The, the future spreads or the price difference between contracts and how they move, that tells us what the commercial traders, those who work in elevators, grain merchandisers, terminals, exporters, this is what they actually, this is how they posi position themselves in the market to show us if they believe the supply and demand is bullish, bearish, neutral, whatever. So we look at the future spreads. We look at how they change over time. All right, and in that whole market structure system, over the years, I've come up with nine different market types. You know, and all it really is based on is, you know, is, is the non-commercial side bullish, bearish, or neutral? What about the commercials? How do they set up? How do they compare? Usually, I shouldn't say that, often, they're in agreement. But, more and more, particularly over the last two years, they are in sharp disagreement. All right, here's a standard look at soybean weekly close. I mean, if this isn't trolling along the bottom, I don't know what is. It cannot move, roughly between eight and a half and nine weekly close, nearby futures contract. So given the idea that the futures market, the trend in the futures reflects the interest of non-commercial or investment traders, what would you say? Going back to 2012, there's that 14, excuse me, 2014, what would you think the flow of money in the soybean market would be? The blue histogram is taken from, it, is, it reflects, it shows the positions of non-commercial traders. It's a net futures position. And this means you take their long contracts and you subtract off their short, and it gives it to you uh, in a histogram form. And the red line, again, is the weekly close. If we go all the way back to 2012 and look at the blue histogram, uh, Non-commercial traders held a net long of, I don't even know how many contracts that is, I've got the wrong thing up, it's probably 60, 80,000 contracts. Since then, they've been pulling money out of soybeans. 
yeah, okay, 2013, 14, and 15, we saw huge crops, both corn and soybeans. So there was no, according to USDA and everyone else, there was no fundamental reason. And when you see the spikes actually go down, that means they hold more short futures, or they've sold more futures than they've bought, all right? Well, we got that little spike last summer in 2015, and we saw that they rebuilt at least a small net long futures position. But where are they now? They've gone short again. We keep getting bearish numbers, so the investment side continues to sell. We're down to about 50, 60,000 contracts short, and they're really not all that worried about it. There's no fundamental reason out there for them to start buying. So the pressure that we've seen has come from the non-commercial side. But notice on that slide, the futures market quit going down. Despite the fact investors continue to sell, the futures market is sitting flat. Why is that? because the commercial side of the market is still bullish. Those that are trading cash grain, they're in the underlying cash market, are still bullish. And you can see that in those future spreads. If we look at the black line, that's the March to May. That's the price difference between the March to May futures contract. The blue line is the difference between the May, July. We have a very small, carry. And what that means is the deferred contract has only a small price premium over the nearby contract. There's a great deal of concern, or there has been a great deal of concern, about finding enough supplies domestically to meet demand. And that's what's provided support. In fact, it wasn't, what, a couple months ago with and this was when Brazil was seeing some, you know, some hot weather, I believe in December or January, we actually saw, despite all the numbers we've seen from USDA, the March contract go to a price premium over the May. Notice that it poked its head above the zero line. That's usually an extremely bullish supply and demand situation. Now, as we look, starting to sag a little bit. We've got South American harvest going on, starting to see some pressure coming in the future spreads. Now, this is always fun to show on, in a large room. A lot of, lot of numbers here. But this is how you evaluate whether or not spreads are bullish, bearish, otherwise. If you notice the top row and go over to about the one, two, three, four, fifth column, that's the March to May future spread. At the time I did this, it was what, about a three and a quarter cent carry, so about a three and a quarter cent spread. And then you go down a couple lines and you see 22%. In other words, if I'm a grain merchandiser, and many years ago I was, I'm looking at this and I see that the commercial side of the market's only willing to pay me 22% of the total cost of holding that grain in storage to not sell it right now. They need the crop. They need the cash supplies. Anything less than 33% basically reflects a bullish supply and demand situation. If we look at that again, even in the gut slot of harvest, the May-July timeframe for, uh, for uh, South American harvest, the May-July spread, 31%, something like that, if I can read it correctly still bullish. How is that possible? Well, remember what I said before. USDA generally doesn't have an idea about what total demand for U.S. supplies are. And therefore, they really don't know what our ending stocks are going to be. So the market is reflecting not only that commercial traders at this time couldn't buy supplies. Everybody's sitting tight. At a time when demand remains relatively strong, we see the, we see the effect on the future spreads. Now, 
those could collapse, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. But at least the commercial picture, the supply and demand picture this paints is far different from what we see in the USDA reports. So again, if we look at our market types, we know that the investment traders are bearish, and right now, the commercial, or at least when I put this together, commercial side was still bullish. So what kind of market does that give us? The type seven. And one of the best ways to attack this type of market, number one, it's relatively rare, or at least it used to be. The investment side usually goes along eventually with what the spreads are saying. So this would indicate that we want to be on the same side as the investment traders and we want to be short some futures just as they are. But we want to be careful again because of what the future spreads are showing us. All right. Here's the conflicting opinions that I've been looking at. Confliction. Great. Good typo right there at the top. Confliction opinions. Anyway. Um, here's the conflicting opinions that I'm looking at. Fundamentally, domestic and global supply and demand continues to grow more bearish according to USDA reports. However, future spreads are showing a completely different opinion. They're actually long-term bullish, or at least through this spring and early summer, at least what we see right now. So how do we, how do we fix that? Well, it's not the only opinion that's different. There's also a change, you know, there's also a, a strong difference in opinion between what the non-commercial traders are looking at. They're following USDA. They're selling this market. And again, they're selling it against what the spreads are showing. So we could either, what could happen here? Number one, if the non-commercial side finally says, okay, spreads are right, we're gonna start buying. We're gonna cover that short position. And not only are we gonna cover that, we're gonna keep adding. We're gonna, we're gonna start building a long position because the situation's far more bullish than what we were trading. That would give us a type one market. All right. On the other hand, if the commercial traders are tired of running against the wind, always pushing against an investment position that just won't change its mind, again, keep in mind that long sideways pattern that we've got going on. If they get tired of fighting that and they throw in the towel, and the spreads start to strengthen, and they start trending down, the carry starts strengthening, well, what it's reflecting is we could be seeing less demand all of a sudden for U.S. supplies. We are, we would be displaced by South America, these, these, these huge crops that they're harvesting right now. The strong dollar's not helping, the weak Brazilian real, all of these things. And that could result in, if we just go to a neutral level of carry, that could result in a type eight market, or if we turn bearish, all of a sudden we're looking at a type nine. Now, out of all this, what seems the most logical? I know we get hit over the head all the time. And as I go from place to place making, making presentations and as you folks uh, attend different market outlooks, they're all the same, except for one. They're all bearish. They're all painting this picture that it's only gonna get worse. That, you know, there really is no hope here for 2016, 17. And that's quite possible. I mean, not to sugarcoat it, but it's gonna be difficult. Um, so we could move to that type one, meaning we just wanna be long cash. This just, I don't know, doesn't seem like the environment that's gonna happen. It could, it could. But just as logically, if USDA is actually close to being right 
and everything is as bearish as what's being projected right now, that eight or nine ultimately would say, we got to be short the cash. We got to be hedged. We got to be, we got to take care of whatever we've got, not only left over from last year, but as we look ahead to the 2016 crop. Okay. I was a little late getting here this morning because, as we all know, the U again, as I've said a couple of times, USDA's Ag Outlook Forums going on this week, and they were releasing their not initial look at new crop with this morning's, uh, with this morning's presentations. And it was supposed to come out about 8.15 uh, Eastern time, 7.15 our time, but it takes a while to get all the numbers. And what I was most interested in was the acreage, because that has been the debate. Basically, as always, going back to last fall, who's gonna gain more acres? Is it gonna be corn? Is it gonna be soybeans? Back in December, we were hearing large increases in 2016 for both. Then, as January went along, we started to hear those trimmed back a little bit. Maybe soybeans were going to continue to gain on corn. Corn, we weren't going to see quite as many acres as what we initially thought. So, there was this sense of anticipation going into this morning's announcement. And when the numbers finally came out, guess what the markets did? nothing at least the last i looked at it and for that i applaud them i applaud the traders for not going crazy now they may have since i've come over uh they may have you know really started to move but initially when they saw the acreage numbers markets just didn't move uh the red column that is the acreage numbers that were released for soybeans this morning. The blue column is again the 2015-16 that we saw in February, similar to the same thing that we saw earlier. Um, the rest of the numbers in the red column I pulled from my Ag Summit, uh, DTN Ag Summit that I presented in, uh, in December in Chicago. And that's where I always give my annual outlook so I don't really know what USDA is projecting right now for total, per, total supplies, total production, excuse me, total, total demand and so on, or their ending stocks. The only thing I know is their acreage that they released this morning and the average cash price, the very bottom line. That's a little concerning. But to me, the fact that acres actually are expected now to decrease uh, last year we saw 82.7. This morning it was projected at 82.5. In December it was projected at 85. We were supposed to see 85 million acres of soybeans. So we're still looking at about 3.7 billion bushels of, of production if we hit trend line yield of 45.8. Trend line yields nothing more than, you know, everyone's guess at what it might be. Everyone has a different way of figuring it. Uh, that's what I've come up with is about 445.8. We could see ending stocks next year still hovering in that 375, 380 million bushel range. But with 450 million bushel, cash price was supposed to be 880. And since I don't know what USDA actually had for its ending stocks number, but I do know their not initial look at next year's average cash price came in at eight and a half. So they may be trimming more from demand than what I'm doing at this point. Um, so what do we think we know about the soybean market right now? had to change this slide because initially it said U.S. producers may increase their, you know, planted area in 2016. Now it looks like, at least in this set of numbers, and we'll see how much it changes in the March 31st prospective plantings report, 
Right now, we're looking at slightly less planted acres. If trend line yield comes in at about 45.8, it, it would result in production just under 3.8. Last year, supposedly, U.S. had 3.93 billion bushels. The 450 million bushels ending stocks for 1516 are still going to be a problem because they become the beginning stocks. Now, that's if we stay at this level. I'm going to back up a couple slides. Notice over at my Ag Summit presentation, I had two different lines, two different results for ending stocks for uh, 16, 17, because it used two different figures up in red on the far right-hand side. I had 465 million bushels and 178. Seems like a huge difference between those two because that would be the expected range of possible ending stocks for 2015-16. How in the world can it be that large? If I look at the last three years and I compare what the September 30th, the following year's September 30th quarterly stocks report shows for soybean ending stocks, and take that as a percentage of USDA's highest ending stocks figure during the course of the marketing year, that's how far off it's been. And this year, the high, as we saw in that very first slide, was last May at 500 million bushels. So using the per average percent change is where we get that 178 million bushels. That changes everything. Will it happen this year? Who knows? It's going to be tough because of the strong U.S. dollar, unless we actually didn't quite produce as much as we had last year, unless we actually have much stronger demand than what's being talked about or projected right now. So there is a little bit of wiggle room in the, in the beginning stocks numbers. I'm not, I'm not ready to commit these to stone yet. That won't be for a number of years when they can quit changing the, the figures around. So, you know, while it looks bearish, while their bottom line looks bearish with the, with the ending stocks and average cash price, there's still, because of what we see in the future spreads right now, there's still this glimmer of hope. So let's get back to where we were. Uh, beginning stocks, as I was talking about, at least right now, we're still looking at 450 million bushels. We're going to have to see increased domestic demand, and that remains questionable. You know, with the huge crops in South America, again, the strong dollar, a lot of things are going to have to happen to be able to increase our demand. Right now, you know, based on what we see, I'm not going to call everything bearish at this point. I think at worst, it's neutral to bearish with the door still open to being a better situation as we get deeper into the 16, 17 marketing year than what most are looking for. And here's why. Again, quick look at the new crop future spreads. You know, we see the Nov Jan showing only 28% carry. Jan March, less than that. The market itself, the commercial side itself, is still bullish soybeans. Here's a long-term look. Uh, at the, this is a lot of what I look at every day. Um, the most important thing that I see on this is that top chart, the monthly price chart, again, just trapped in this zone where it can't break out of. The threat is if it breaks down. But I still think if we start to see some non-commercial short covering, if we see any sort of problems with new crop whatsoever, I think we could actually start pushing towards the high side of this range. So, outlook. Um, sorry, I have the as with corn. I forgot to take that off. Fundamental view of soybeans from USDA's point of view is bearish. Domestic and world-ending stocks continue to grow larger. 
We have seen a slight reduction, though, in ending stocks to use, as we talked about. Brazil's production left at 100, Argentina's 58.5. Again, because of the different structures that are possible, I still think we could see stability for now in the corn market, but a spring rally cannot be counted out. If we have any kind of weather scares, planning delays, and so on, getting us back up into the 920, 950 range really doesn't seem that hard. Now, a couple of outside markets. Here's the U.S. dollar. We keep hitting our head up just a little over 100, and then we start to go down. But because of the global situation, this week with Britain threatening to leave the European Union, the dollar just cannot break. You know, I've been one of the few dollar bears that think the dollar should come down when we heard Chairwoman Yellen talking about not only may we not increase rates anymore here in 2016, but she floated the idea of what negative rates would look like. I really thought that would drive the last nail in the dollar's coffin, but it didn't. It keeps finding reasons to hold up in this area and stay strong limiting the amount of export interest for U.S. supplies. Also, the Dow Jones Industrial has been struggling in a downtrend. Uh, my fear is if we break the 15.5, it would project down to a 12.4. Um, that could put more pressure on commodities as well if we get into a panic selling situation. All right, that has my part of it, and I wanted to save a little time for questions on any of the markets. Todd's going to be running around with, I guess he, I'll stand here. <laughs> yep. So if anybody has questions for Darren, you can Any question about, uh, about I've got one right here. Hang on. Markets or anything that I've talked about this morning. Okay, Delbert. How do you choose those types of markets? That has come from, oh, watching these things for 25 years or so, or more. I've lost count. Um, seeing how everything fits together. It basically boiled down to, there's really only three opinions that they can hold, and we only have two sides of every market. So three squared gives us those nine different market types. And so depending on the trends then, we can start breaking down into what type of market that is and how we should approach it, how we should position ourselves, attack the market, try to use it to our advantage. Other questions? The, uh, I heard this morning coming over that uh, there's a summit going on in China Mm -hmm. And the economists generally think the UN is overvalued still and will be uh, devalued sometime. What effect would that have? It's, you know, the the economic strength of China is is a very is a real concern. Uh, and, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it by saying, you know, as I did before, that not all commodity demand is created equal. You know, there, there is still a lot of talk that China is going to devalue the yuan again, and if so, you know, the world's going to still look for some sort of safe haven uh, when it comes to a currency, and that's going to continue to provide support to the dollar. Now, what else that's going to do is that we could see the Shanghai Composite Index, China's equity market, continue to fall, uh, putting pressure on the rest of the Asian market sector and possibly the European market sector. So when I talked about the p fact that the Dow could have some more room to go down, I think that's where it would come from, would be the first, you know, for, not the first, but the next trigger uh, of some economic weakness in China. Give Darren a nice round of applause. Darren Newsom, of course, with DTN Progressive Farmer.